Hello, hello, welcome to Reach of the STEM podcast. Now I'm moving into a different field, medicine, and here with me I have Andrei Gizdov, who's gonna expand on the project he's been doing around skulls and very interesting stuff. So could you expand on that? Okay, so firstly, great pronunciation of the name. Thank Honestly, you. most people struggle to pronounce the Bulgarian name. Merci. Very good. So basically the idea is, you see this guy, so we're gonna refer to him as Johnny until the rest of the video. And basically Johnny has those lines on the surface which are called sutures. Mm -hmm. And if you've touched the baby's head, which might sound weird, but most people actually have touched the baby's head, um, they have a soft spot which is located around this area. And now, this soft spot actually extends along the line here, along the suture. And the reason for which is there is because when you're really young, when you're a baby, your skull grows really fast. Mm -hmm. And the new bone forms exactly at the edges of the separate regions. So really, there needs to be some empty space left between the separate regions for the new bone to form. Mm -hmm. And that is why when you're young, you have a soft spot and your sutures are wide. As you grow up, adults obviously don't have a soft spot on their head. So obviously this space between their other parts of the skull gets filled, so the sutures get narrower and narrower. And they eventually turn to what we can see on, on the surface of Johnny. And this process of turning the sutures into something more narrow is gradual. So it's not like one day I'm going to have a soft spot on my head and on the next day I'm not going to turn, it's going to be completely flat. It's gradual and it happens over time, as the body ages, as the person grows up to adolescence. And the idea is that archaeologists, anthropologists, criminologists have been using this dependency between how wide the sutures are and what the age of the person is. So they have tried to estimate the age based on how wide and how much space there is between the different parts of the skull. But so far, this has been done through manual inspection and through manual assessment of the degree of fusion on the suture. So for example, they would look at the pattern that they see on the surface and they would say, well, I can see that it's a completely continuous pattern with very wide gaps, so I'm going to give him a young person, right? Because that corresponds to a lot of empty space between the different skull parts. More modern techniques actually don't only assess the surface, but also assess the cross-section. So cross-section basically means if you cut the skull like this, what you would see between the bones. You would actually see that the suture extends throughout the depth. And this can be seen, I'm not sure, on the images here. Yes. So those are images of the cross-section. And more modern studies use CT scanners to extract such images. Now the purpose of my project is to not rely on the human assessment for basically saying how old the person is based on the image, but to rely on the computer perception. To rely on the computer algorithm that can objectively give a rating of fusion for each of those images and not rely on the human opinion. Because even in cross-sectional images, again, a human has so far been responsible to give rating to every image. Like for example, a scale of 1 to 5, a scale of 1 to 10, it depends on the particular studies. But there's a very big problem because one anthropologist might say that this image is a 3, another might say that this image is a 3.3, another might say it's a 2.9. 2 you know, they don't have a specific criteria for what they say is a particular rating. And this is where the problem comes and this is why it's subjective and it produces relatively inaccurate measurements. So the idea of my project is basically to create a program that is automatically able to measure the distance between the sutures, not only the distance, but also several other metrics that describe the degree of fusion between the bones. And then to, in the future study, based on a lot more skulls, to assess it and to see how well it, it correlates to the age of people. So far I've correlated it to the age of uh, 13 people and shows very high correlation, very statistically significant correlation. And the next step is to test it, test it on a bigger sample that can validate the goodness and basically how, how good results the segmentation technique produce, produces yeah that's so that is, yeah. yeah the ultimate purpose yes. of the project, yeah that sounds awesome and how you explained it using Johnny as your model that of course our brain is expanding but simultaneously our skull has to as well so it's like we are talking about bone but it's also a living thing because of the osteocytes but in it you developed an algorithm so that was essential because uh, just as you said there is no not a common ground or the standard method of measuring mm. these amount I know that you're working with algorithms. How did that experimental setting work in your case? Can you expand on for those ones who are more interested in the AI field of your project? We can skip the part of generating the images. Mm -hmm. No, actually, 
we can focus on one particular part of generating the images. So the idea is that basically methods so far for extracting images of the cross-section of the suture have relied on the person manually adjusting the incline of the suture so that it matches with the vertical plane that intersects it. So what anthropologists so far have been doing is putting the skull in the 3D modeling software, generating a vertical plane, and then manually adjusting the skull's incline so that the vertical plane intersects it perpendicularly to the surface. There's a problem with this because it takes a lot of time and it's also very subjective again. So even though someone might say this plane is perpendicular to the surface, doesn't mean it necessarily is. The first part of the project is to generate a method that automatically and faster generates cross-sectional images along the surface. And this is done through firstly generating the 3D model of the skull. So this is the 3D model of the skull. And this is basically done for a conventional algorithm for surface generation, which is called marching cubes. I'm not going to get into detail for this, but the most impressive part, after having generated the 3D model, is actually finding the points at which we want to generate images. So this is something that I've done with the help of an algorithm that I invented myself. Let's say the person marks four points on the suture, like it's shown here, but they want to generate 100 points. So what happens is, we need to generate 96 more points in between those four points to know where we want to generate our images. So to do this, I need to find a path between the points. So the idea is that if we have more complicated cases of more than three points, they're split into separate cases of just three points. So now the way that it works with three points is imagine that this is our starting point, this is our middle point, this is our end point. The minimum number of points that the algorithm needs to work in order to work is three. So now, the question is, which path of points, starting from this one, let's say, my starting point, do I need to take to go through my middle point and end up at my end point? That path needs to be straight so that I know it's on the suture. What happens is, starting from my first point, I start looking at the surrounding me vertices. From each of the surrounding me vertices, I draw a normal towards the vector defined by the start and end point. So then I record this normal. Then I do the same for the other surrounding me vertices. And then that is the normal from this vertex towards the line defined by the start and end point. So what happens is, from my middle point then, I draw another normal towards the line defined by the start and end point. And I compare the normals that I have already calculated from my vertices to this normal. And I pick the point which, makes, which has a normal towards the start end line which makes the smallest angle with the normal from the midpoint. Mm -hmm. So you can see this point here is clearly not on a straight path. So if you compare the normal that this point makes with the start and end line to the angle between, basically if you compare the angle between this normal and that normal to let's say the angle between this normal from that point to that normal, this angle will be much larger. This angle is almost 90 degrees, whereas this angle will be, let's say, I mean, I'm approximating about five degrees. So obviously we would want to pick the point that makes the smallest angle with the normal in the middle. And that's what achieves the straight path then. That's real cool. So how you visualized it and how others can access it and just really see the methodology and the theorems, how you created your algorithm in your system. So we can like refer to that um, vertical line in the middle as the standard point to which you compare those other points surrounding mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrap up, we heard about your project and what you've been working on, but you also participated at international competitions, including ISEF this year and also yeah. USIS. So what do you enjoy about being in those national and international platforms? To be fair, I think the biggest thing that I enjoy about those competitions is the people that are here. Mm -hmm. So they're usually people who I can share the most crazily sounding thoughts about science experiments, about anything really, mm -hmm. and we would still be able to make a discussion and not say, what, what is this, what is this nonsense, you know? Mm -hmm. Which was what would usually happen when in, in a normal everyday conversation. So with those people, you can really have conversation on any topic. It would be an exciting conversation from my experience. And yeah, they're generally very cool people to discuss complicated topics with. So this is the things that I enjoy. Another thing that I greatly like is the fact that there are so many interesting projects here. So things related to science that I've never even guessed. Like for example, the imaging, there's a physics project about imaging, about seeing gases, um, which are usually not visible to the human eye. This is uh, something that I never really thought existed. And you know, you learn so many new things at, th at, at events like this, which I don't think you can learn any other way. Because I would never think of Googling Schindler imaging. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but you know, so many things that you wouldn't really get an idea even exist 
in theory you can check anything online but you don't really know what to check unless you know that it's there so here you really learn what is there you learn parts of science that you never really got to touch with in the past so for example I'm a computer guy I would never think of anything related to physics anything related to let's say molecular biology and here is a place where I can get a broad view on a lot of science topics and those are the things that I most enjoy about events like this we can get to know so many cool projects and it's like a place or a platform to be where you feel yourself understood. You are in an environment where you can expand your horizons. It's like when you're learning a language. You can look up words online, but when you're immersed in the culture, that's a totally different experience. And I think that could be translated into science as well. Uh, what's like one or two words of encouragement you would give to those who want to move into science? Hmm. Two words of encouragement. I know that one it's going to be, no actually, I'm just going to say, work your ass off. That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Work and stay motivated. That's a Buddha call. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, also just being consistent in your work and do as much as you can possibly. Yeah. So thank you for being on the podcast and sharing about your invention. I know you've had a lot of judges today, yeah. so I think that's a good sign. Thank you very much. I've had two judges so far, which, I mean, I hope there are three more left because it could be between five and mm -hmm. six. I'm hoping I'm going to get six more impressions. But yeah, so far it's going great. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the other days. Yeah. It's going to be fun. As per usual, here goes the post uses update. Andre won one of the joint research center prizes, so he received a two day stay at its ISPR site in Italy. Congratulations and shout out to him. Also, thank you for joining in the podcast or the interview, Spice Up with the Visuals, dear YouTube watcher. Also, make sure to take extra care of yourselves and your surrounding in the middle of the corona crisis. The top tips come to you from WHO, wash your hands frequently, get a little bit on the introverted side and maintain social distancing. And if you have a fever, cough, difficulty breathing, call your doctor. Until then, follow the pod on social media and you can always tune into the episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, and SoundCloud. Thank you for taking a few moments of science with us.